thanks to the board for allowing me to find a new home for this collection. And uh, I tell you, I had a, uh, a long-standing display at the full-time permanent display at the Corpus Christi Museum. And uh, it folded after about 20 years, and uh, they weren't interested in my tackle. Uh, Rockport, the uh, Texas Maritime Museum in Rockport had a, I curated an exhibit there that ran about 20 years, and Harvey took the roof off, and uh, their mission now is uh, mari uh, maritime artifacts, not fishing. They want one rod in the whole place over there, so... Anyway, I came to Cliff and Ashley, and uh, they brought the board over, and uh, they looked at my museum at the house uh, and said, we'll take everything you've got. So I'm really happy. Uh, many ways. I, I spent so much of my childhood over here fishing, uh, living on the piers and jetties and, you know, fishing rod in one hand, BB gun in the other, giving Mother Nature holy hell. And... Uh, I like to say uh, my diet over here sometimes on the jetties and the piers for two weeks on end would consist of premium saltine crackers, spam, Vienna sausage, and sardines. <laughs> and that will do a number on you. <laughs> but that didn't matter. It was all about fishing. So I started collecting when I was uh, about 12 years old. Uh, if anybody collected anything since they were 12, you've got a you've got a whole bunch of stuff, and I and I do. Uh, always had a fondness for fishing lures and the old fishing tackle, and uh, I didn't really know what I had until I retired and uh, started pulling everything out of boxes. I knew I had some good stuff, but I didn't know how complete it was. And uh, as I got everything organized, I saw that, yeah, this really needs to go somewhere. So what I'm going to talk about tonight are six lure companies that started in Corpus Christi back in the 1930s. Uh, two of them started out with the, the guys being commercial rod and reelers. They didn't have nets. They didn't have any of that. They made a living with the rod and reel, throwing lures that they carved. And... Uh, Two, two of them ended up being the people wanting their lures, and uh, they started selling them, and then after, uh, carved out of wood and off bicycles and corpus. And after World War II, when we finally had plastics, uh, started molding them out of plastic, and uh, we, uh, and, and the rest is kind of history. So I'm going to talk about these six companies, and uh, it's a, uh, it's a long PowerPoint. I, bear with me. I'm going to cut through some of it. But this is my, well, I don't like power, uh, laser pointers. This is my old school laser pointer. You know, if somebody's not really, you know, paying attention up on the front. And it doesn't need batteries. So, But we're going to talk about the Hump Lure Company. We're going to talk bingo. We're going to talk about... Uh, Plug and Shorty. Uh, we're going to talk about some of these subcategories of companies. Uh, Farmers Lure Company over in Ingleside. Uh, Sportsman Lure Company that operated in Corpus. Mathis and Robstown at one time. But all these companies, once, the, uh, once they were produced in plastic, by about 1969, all of them were closed. Uh, that's about the extent of it. 1930s to up until about 1970. And uh, I had some big, big hits back in the day when I was a 20-something-year-old 20 20 kid trying to meet all these guys that were still alive. And uh, I, they just gave me stuff. Said, kid, you interested in this stuff? Take it. Take it. Take it. And uh, ended up with, with lots and lots of stuff. A lot of it uncatalogued, experimental, prototype stuff. But... Uh, Let's go ahead, and that's my show-and-tell board there. And I've got that in my shop, and every time I walk by that, I catch a hook on, on my, in my shirt or something. And I can't, my wife is up in the front of the house. I'm back there hooked up, and I've got to mo move that thing or put some tubing on those hooks. 
Okay, one of the earliest companies was Nichols, later became Pico. Pico is Padre Allen Company. Uh, Nichols uh, started carving baits in the 30s out of wood. It's a beautiful, beautiful baits. Uh, these are probably from the, the mid-30s. So many of these, uh, before there was hardware, uh, screw eyes and all that, you would take a sewing needle and you would heat it up and burn a hole through that uh, lure and then burn it, then put your hook on there, run it back through, and then run it through again. You couldn't change your hooks on them. So uh, if they lost a bait uh, or lost a hook, they, they had to start all over on these things. But this just kind of an array of some of the early, early, early Fred Nichols stuff. Later on, uh, in 1948, Nichols converted over to Pico, Padre Allen Company, and probably any bass fisherman is very aware of the old Pico perch. And uh, these are some of the original uh, hand-carved wooden Pico perch before the plastic was available. Another bait was the Glimo Minnow. These are the hand-carved baits that came before plastic was available after World War II. And these are all very collectible. And by the way, the museum is going to be, the preserve is going to be looking for special pieces. I don't have everything. There are certain pieces that I want to acquire to go into this display. So if anybody has anything, they're wondering, what am I going to do with this stuff? Uh, let Ashley or, or Cliff know. Uh, these are the Nichols Jumbo Killers. That's a complete set of them. Uh, very similar to some of the later baits that came out, but these were these were all wood and all uh, all uh, hand painted and uh, very very neat plugs. Okay, the, the Pico line is much much larger than that. I want, I've got this is 88 slides I've got. I apologize, my other one is 230 or something, <laughs> and I didn't want to keep y'all here all night, so this. David Sykes has taken a lot of pictures, for, photographs for me lately, and uh, I haven't been able to incorporate those yet into a, a more recent uh, deal. Uh-oh, what I do here? Okay, we had a fellow here by the name of Anton Stetner that came here in 1929 to Corpus as a fuller brush salesman. I mean, I grew up hearing about you know, there were jokes about fuller brush salesmen. There really were. He came here from Minnesota, big time tournament fisherman up there. Came down here on a sales deal, never went back. Set up camp over on North Beach, got his family to come down here, and he made a living with the rod and reel. And uh, he, uh, he spun, sunburned very, very easily, and he wore a full ski mask all the time. If you tried to talk to him, uh, he would jerk his plug away. He didn't want anybody to see what he was using. Uh, there was a statement he made in 1948 when he was approached by Doug English, who owned Bingo, and said, Shorty, that's what they called him, plug and Shorty, if you will go and let, let me produce your plugs for you, you can make a whole lot more money selling lures than you can fishing. And Shardy thought for it about a little bit. He said, Doug, I appreciate the offer, but if my plugs got out on the market, people would be catching more fish, and it would drive the price of fish down for me. And right now I'm getting three cents a pound for fish. <laughs> so no thank you. He thought about it a while, and they, they went into business together producing Plug and Shardy. That's his Hollywood shot, I think. This was a little... Had a... I got to know his daughter real well. She said, uh, when I was 15, I painted that on the side of Daddy's boat. But he was real famous around Corpus and around here. He was, he, wherever the fish were, he was, that's when he first moved from Minnesota down here and set up a little camp over on North Beach, Corpus Christi Beach. And uh, you can tell by the car. And he's already got lures in his hat. Those are all obviously hand-carved lures. And... Uh, that's what the shop looked like at the time. That's Doug English who owned the owned the business, and that's Miss Stetner, Miss Shorty, they called. Uh, he only want mostly wanted women 
to put the lures together because of the, they were so good with their hands, the dexterity. And uh, I think that, that was holds true. Okay, anything that has a wing on it is a plug and shardy. Uh, shrimp, fish, these are the, the perch. And what's cool about them, and very innovative for the time, and still is, it's got three line ties, so you can adjust the angle. The, the go, and, and depending on the speed of your retrieve, you can regulate the depth of that plug just by the, the retrieve and the line tie. And uh, a lot of these are, were never, these are one of one of a kind. If you went into the bingo shop and said, Doug, you don't make what I want. I want you to make one that da da da. He'd say, okay, no problem, we can make it, but you gotta buy 12. You gotta buy a dealer box. <laughs> so they would set back, they'd make 13 or 15 or whatever and set one aside. That's the kind of stuff I got that was never produced. So a lot of the, there's even one in the middle there that says plug and shorty on it, so kind of cool. <laughs> Uh, there's the plug and shorty shrimp. There were three sizes, and they had uh, about 20 colors, I think, in them. But everything has a wing on it, and had the big bull shrimp, and then had the uh, medium-sized shrimp, and then the smaller one. And that's how they kind of came on a card with a cellophane on them. The guy would walk in with a bucket with these things hanging on it, and ask the bait dealer, mom and pop bait dealer, peer dealer, whatever, peer owner, how many do you want? And they'd sell them right there. There's more of them. The, the plug and shorty minnows, large minnows, small minnows. And uh, all this stuff is coming to the museum. So my wife is very happy about this. Because I, I continue to take over her space. And I don't care if, if I just hang a case of lures back there kind of hidden with a lot of other stuff, she'll notice it every time. <laughs> okay, this is bingo. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Uh, that's just something, a painting somebody did. Uh, Popo, if anybody remembers him over in Rockport, he sold a lot of lures. Doug English sold uh, bingo lures that uh, uh, each made five different models in 58 colors, each one of them. Did the fish know the difference between the, no, no, but the fishermen did. I got to have that one. And it may be as subtle as white. One had an orange back and a yellow belly. The other one have a yellow back and an orange belly. Would the fish know that? But the fishermen. This is a display I got out of a beer joint back in the 80s over at Near next to the King's Inn, if it, in over of Baffin Bay, uh, there was a commercial fisherman that hung this in the beer joint. Uh, in a, it's a Winchester knife case. It's in, and uh, I got it off the, off, bought it off the beer joint wall. Bandito called me up one Sunday. Said uh, read an article I wrote. Said you don't have anything. Come see me. I went to see him and uh, ended up with a lot of stuff, including this. He wouldn't give me his name. It was just Clink. I guess that was his bandito name. I don't know. These are the, they made a big one offshore. Bingo did, the Super Bingo. And uh, <coughs> it was more for casting and uh, trolling out in the Gulf. Real pretty lures. They made uh, Queen Bingo. Uh, Made the Lucky U, some really colorful. Uh, these are a little bit later. They were actually produced in uh, Houston and, and until the early 80s. Some of these are, are Houston baits, but uh, just wanted to show you some of the colors and some of the different models that were available. These are, uh, in the catalog sheet for this one, it showed there were 11 colors. I had 115 colors. Again, it was because of them keeping one out of all those custom orders they had. And uh, a lot of you freshwater fishermen will recognize uh, some of these these patterns. One of, the, one of the things that I think is worthy of note, until about 1960, there were very few people in saltwater, especially in the bays, using artificial lures. It was all shrimp, cut bait, squid. And then some of these marketers like... Uh, Doug English 
with bingo. They were real marketers, and uh, they would come out and uh, hand out lures. Doug would go to, on a day like this where the fish are all in the harbor, he'd go to Con, Con Brown Harbor and Aransas Pass, say, I'm going to give you this lure, but every time you catch a fish on it, you must yell bingo. <laughs> and the word was around the coast, bingo, bingo. Uh, Mr. Mr. Humphreys, uh, I'll get to him in a bit. He, don't get bumps, catch fish with humps. <laughs> so, you know, all of a sudden these guys that use nothing but bait or something, well, let me put a couple of those in my tackle box. You know, maybe I'll... And it say, well, you may not catch as many fish, but you're going to catch bigger fish. And people slowly started, started doing that. Some of the tackle evolved, too. I was telling a gentleman a while ago, he said, when, when did we get the Mitchell 300 reel? And when did we get the 5,000 ambassador, the red reel? About 1960 is when those were available here. But some of these guys, these hardcore anglers, uh, plugger guys down here in the 40s got to know the pilots out at the Naval Air Station who were flying regularly to Europe. They got immediately got Polaroids from the pilots and they were able to bring back the uh, French reel, the 300 Mitchell uh, over here and uh, they would bring back the, the red reel, the 5000 Ambassador. It was about five years later when we could finally buy both of those in Shoppers World or Gibson's or one of the discount houses. They were way ahead of the curve on getting this stuff. That's another one. Uh, there were nine colors made that just shows you uh, how somebody would come in and say, Doug, I want black spots on this lure. Okay, got it. Got about 12. No problem. And here's how they were packaged in that thin, thin, delicate uh, cellophane that was available at the time. You know, before World War II, our only plastic was Bakelite. Uh, we had some hard German rubber. Uh, but until World War II, when we finally got Tenite, we had no, no plastic, and everything just blossomed after that. I mean, the colors became available. Uh, <laughs> Instead of wood rods, you had uh, fiberglass rods now. Montague came out. And a lot of people started uh, fishing in salt water and started using lures. The bingo flash. Uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of fish were caught on these, and they will still catch fish. But they're, they're uh, kind of pricey to fish, fish with. A lot of these, when Doug would have big part, he owned Shamrock Island at one time. He had a big fishing and hunting club over there. And uh, he'd have annual Christmas parties, and everybody would get a uh, lure with their name inside of it, not just written on the outside, Merry Christmas, blah, 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 Humble Oil Company, all kinds of stuff. Um, so he was very much a promoter. He owned... Uh, radio stations throughout Texas and uh, Oklahoma. He had a banana plantation in Panama, and he was a great, big, crazy fisherman. But he carved his own lures back in the 30s and ended up being in the business of uh, producing plastic lures. The two lure companies <coughs> out of Corpus in the late 50s and early 60s through the up to about 1970, had as many as five salesmen on the road out of Corpus to all five Gulf states and all the way up to the Carolinas selling lures made in Corpus. And they had every mom and pop bait shop, every pier, every, anybody that would sell fish and tackle, they would go in there and uh, give them the whole spiel on, uh, you ought to try these. Okay, Hump Lure Company started in Corpus uh, as Coastal Lure Company in 1956. It was bought out and moved to El Campo by Mr. Earl Humphreys. And that's where the name Hump comes from, is from Earl Humphreys. I interviewed Mr. and Mrs. Humphreys. Uh, he was 98 and she was 95. Interviewed him, wrote an article on him. And... Uh, Really, it was very special for me to, to meet them. This is a complete set of hump lures. Uh, it took me about 40 years to put that together. 
Uh, there are about four of them in uh, known, and I've got two complete sets. And uh, one set's going to come over here. They're really beautiful. Lures. Fish, fish with numbers. That was a big thing with hump. Everything had a number stamped on the side of it. And uh, every newspaper along the coast would run their fishing report. So and so caught something. And they would say so and so caught 14 trout on a hump M5 or an A17 or whatever. Ms. Humphreys had uh, the old black uh, cardboard. Uh, she would make a, a sales book for the salesman. And when they would go in to the shop, mom and pop shop, they were supposed to open up their book and show all these testimonials. And she would clip newspaper articles all over the coast and put in there and underline in red, hump, whatever the hump number was at fit. And I've got two of those notebooks. That okay, this is kind of off the deal, but I want to tell it anyway. <clears throat> when I... Uh, interviewed them in El Campo, he had the worst case of Alzheimer's I've ever seen. And I've, I've seen some. And uh, had a full-time nurse with him, and Miss Hump, Miss Humphreys was so gracious, or just old southern lady. And as soon as I got there, he'd gone back into the bedroom in his wheelchair. The nurse was pushing him around. He was holding his lures, knowing enough to know that I was coming there, something but to deal with lures. And uh, the therapy that he had was to put a lap board on his wheelchair and, and hand him some blank lures, and he would paint them like a child would. And I've got a bunch of those. <clears throat> and uh, when I left, I think he was kind of excited after he saw that I wasn't a bad guy or, or whatever. But... Uh, he went back in the room, had the nurse push him, lived an old, old two-story house right there on the bay. And he, he wanted something, brought it out, and he handed me a pickle jar full of kerosene or coal oil that had a bunch of rusty hooks in it. He was restoring those hooks in there, and he wanted me to see that. And, uh, but he had probably the, yeah, anyway, that was kind of a departure from where, but, uh, there you go, bumper sticker. Uh, don't get bumps, catch fish with humps. That was a billboard, billboard, I mean, hum humongous billboard outside of El Campo. These are some of the, the, what they call the Friday night specials, but some of these are the ones that Mr. Hump painted. He loved to paint eyes on things. Uh, anything with big blotched eyes, one he did. I think he did that one. But uh, he was so in love with what he had done with that, that lure company and it was just, just so sad to see see that but they'd go down to the shop on Friday nights all the friends fishermen drink beer and each one they'd sit down and make lures so these are what they call the Friday night specials just that's what the dealer box looked like if you went in uh, all of them had dealer boxes of 12 and uh, you walk in and say what? how many do you want Sportsman Lure Company, that's another one uh, started in Corpus, uh, ended up doing some production in Mathis and some in Robstown. But uh, these, this, they, they had several different sizes of the uh, minnows, wiggling minnow, in a lot of different colors. And uh, the green, that's all one company, just their, their different lures all in that same green. Farmer Lure Company, Fred Farmer in Ingleside. He made uh, two shrimp. He made the uh, Corpus Christi shrimp, which had the nose pull on it. I just love this laser pointer. Uh, and then had a head pull, the Corpus Christi wiggling shrimp. And then had one called the Boogie Red. Boogie Reds. Actually, they pronounced it Booger Red, but you know, I don't know. That's the way it was. And uh, had, I've, I've got a, about, oh, 15 or 20 of these and quite a few of those who've got a pretty good display of, of his stuff. And there was another, these were so common down here as it turned out, these, this was a Houston lure, but they were very, very common down here. But here's some of the boogie reds down here and uh, made some beautiful, beautiful lures. 
And, you know, lures at that time, back in the 40s and 50s, were, you know, 30 cents, 35 cents, or, you know, maybe 55 cents for a special color or something like that. Look where we've gone. This is uh, a company that only lasted for about three years, two years, uh, American Tackle Company. He made all the, uh, a lot of the molds for hump and bingo and uh, so forth made some really pretty lures and you know after uh, about 1960 well let me go back again you know back in the early days to, to doctor up a lure the most you could do would maybe take some of your wife's fingernail polish and dab it up a little bit maybe take some Christmas glitter and a little Elmer's glue and make it shine like that but I tell you after about 1960 when some of the hot hot colors, fluorescent colors came out. It was a whole new game. Everybody got into it. And that's when people really started using lures a lot because those are, these, a lot of these would really catch fish and still will. There's nothing. Wood lures, you know, I've got lots of that stuff. Uh, some of these you from maybe up north will recognize the old Martin, Martin lures. Uh, I've got some Martin shrimp. Uh, there's just a buck. Now, this one, people always say, what the heck is that? <laughs> My uncle carved that when he was, uh, I don't know, probably 1930s, just goofing around. And when I got it, he gave it to me. All this uh, hair was gone off of it, cockroaches, silverfish, all these. We had a pet pig over, over in Sutton, and I trimmed it one time, uh, trimmed the pig's back and got and restored that lure <laughs> but just just a lot of different stuff up there kind of a smorgasbord of hard plastics you know we get one thing that that I'm, I'm doing you know the old lineup of lure you got rows and columns of lures I'm starting to kind of jazz things up a little bit by just kind of doing like pickup sticks just take a lot of lures just throw them in there and that's what I did with these hard plastics. And these are, the way it started out, are, these are kind of lures I, I grew up with or I threw as a kid. Just kind of a little bit of everything. But pretty much coastal. Pretty much uh, what was used down here. Uh, Pete and, and Ashley uh, they and Kathy all said, uh, you know, those types of things would really make a great jigsaw puzzle for the bookstore. And we to do that. Especially always with shrimp. That's what turned me on was when I first started collecting. I said, I've got to have shrimp. So uh, I've got probably 20 cases of shrimp, maybe. I don't know. I brought a few, a couple of them here. But, uh, you know, we've got our Fred Farmer shrimp. Uh, we've got some other stuff in here. DeWitt shrimp. Uh, this one is actually, these were real popular when I was a kid back in the 60s. It's actually a real shrimp inside of that. They just poured a plastic around it. And uh, there's a guy out at the base uh, that had a flip. It's got a metal uh, band in it, real thin piece of metal. So when you pop it, that shrimp actually moves. And then some hand carves, Sportsman Lure Company. All of these are Sportsman. Hard, this hard plastic. Uh -huh. A few of them are soft in here. I've got, you know, that's just stuck up in there, and some of those are. But uh, these are all hard plastic. Uh, tenite is where they started with, which was a pretty good plastic, but nothing like what we've got now. Then to go back older, uh, these, these are probably turn of the century. These are ones where the hole was burned down through with a hot sewing needle and all that stuff, you didn't change your hook. And you'd go to, I, I imagine, to all ends to get that shirt, that lure back if you hung it up on a arster reef or a piling on a pier or whatever. But uh, just different uh, hand carved stuff. Not a corpus lure, but I think the uh, Kelly Wiggler guys were over the other night and they said, we ought to do that. This is hard plastic. It's a New Orleans bait produced in, in New Orleans. 
the head screws off. It's a hollow body. It's drilled. It's ported along the sides. It's meant to put a piece of cut bait or shrimp inside of. You screw the head back on. It's got the feelers and the legs and everything. And they were saying we could make that out of soft plastic. I think there's an application for that one. But that's a complete set of those. Those were the 1950s. Then fluorescent came about. And all the corpus companies all produced these hot colors. And that's when people really start throwing plugs, start throwing lures, when had these hot colors out there. So everybody did it. About 1960. Spoons. Oh, I've got a spoon board now that's going to make heck of a jigsaw puzzle, but metal, you know, all the way from, you know, just the old uh, take your grandmother's spoon and make a spoon out of it or uh, auto spoons, just everything in the world. We had two very, very uh, long-lasting and very high-quality spoon makers in Corpus. I'm not including them here. Mr. Champ. The Mr. stood for Miller Russell, which had a uh, machine shop. But Mr. Champ was a big deal back in, in the day. Plug and Shardy ended up, uh, after the relationship with Bingo ended, uh, farming the Triple Chant Spoon. And again, it had different line ties, and uh, you could regulate its depth. There's some of the, the other spoons over there. Miscellaneous. Uh, these are these are hand carved by Doug English, or early plastic, uh, and then he started producing prototypes. Well, let's go ahead and shave the head on one, or let's change the tail up and experiment. And they'd hand these out to different people. English always said he could tell if a, a man knew how to fish just by the way he walked. Yeah, I don't know, but the old timers were like that. You know, they were, yeah, I, I got him figured out just walking up. You know. So uh, a lot of a lot of the early early stuff there. A lot of the, in uh, so in 19 uh, well in the 40s after World War II plastic was available. The English said we need to make spoons out of plastic, and they tried everything in the world to get plastic. It's like casting a potato chip, basically. It's what it's like. <laughs> but he tried putting metal in them, and uh, it just didn't work. Uh, tried all kinds of different things. And finally ended up putting two of these together and making what's called the Rudy's Bubble, which is a very famous uh, bingo lure. I don't know if i got pictures of them here, but there's a lot of work done on these. And these were all experimental prototype type stuff. Never, never produced, actually. Of course, you know, some of the old pier baits and wiggle divers and things like that. Uh, this this color was so big when I was growing up. If you didn't have one of those in your tackle box, you just weren't with it, buddy. <laughs> it's a tiger stripe, bumblebee, yellow jacket, and very few companies produce that color now. Uh, but boy, if you were tarpon, tarpon fishing, casting, or trolling, and uh, with these south bends and creek chubs, uh, you know, your chances were good. And they've got some hand carved ones back in the back in the day that were, were uh, attempts at uh, having a tiger stripe. I don't know why it's in. There's a, a guy, the barber, uh, Sam the barber, he was real big down on the waterfront. He all, and the reason that's in there, Miss Hump had that, and it, she had underlined in red what hump lure he used that day, and that was in the salesman's book. Okay, what's the most popular lure color ever? Red and white. So uh, that's just a little bit of, of everything. Got some feathers in there, got some fur, got a uh, little bit of everything. That's going to make a real pretty uh, jigsaw puzzle, I think. You know, I mentioned holographics earlier. You know, uh, hardly anything new in fishing. Uh, say holographics, you know, now we've got the sense, we've got the holographics. Hey, what better holographic is there than mother of pearl? I mean, they're, 
holographics are still trying to create that kind of a of a uh, reflective material but uh, that's that's a very old i think that one was from maybe 1800s i don't know it's the oldest spoon i've got but uh, i'm sure maybe the native americans used something like that well that went real fast okay we're going to keep going one of the boat boat captains over here, Bob Flood, gave me this old reel. He was in uh, where were we? Australia for a while back in, and uh, it's just you know the old basic, wind it on, throw it up. That's an old uh, wooden horseshoe reel out of England, I think, is where that's from. But we're gonna. Is that a teaser reel? A what? A teaser reel. Teaser reel? No, no. No, I think they used them in rivers for, there were some weird ways of fishing up in Alaska and Canada that tackled it. Uh, no, I, I don't think so. Before you could buy rods, you had to make your own, find a good piece of river cane or something. Everything was wrapped with fishing line. There was no wrapping thread at the time. And uh, I've... I've uh, my intent with this display is to go from very early to up to about 1970. When graphite came in, that's where I stopped. It's all stopped. And pretty much all the rods would have wooden handles. I got very few that even went as far as cork. It's all, but just some of the old, old stuff. There's the, there's the 300 Mitchell. There's the red reel. Both of them sitting on top of what you really had to have that on was a Shakespeare Wonder Rod, and that what you were cat's pajamas if you had had that that kind of stuff. Then got a little later uh, with the uh, these aren't even going in there. I, these are too late. These are 1970s. You know, ev just some some of the real I had. I had about 500 reels. Uh, most of them are now on rods that are coming over here. But this is just an array. You know, this is all newer stuff for the most part. There's no Shakespeare president in there and uh, some service reels. But uh, the old uh, spinning reels. They're just uh, absolute works of art. Some, some of them, the old records. There was the... Uh, a French reel is really good. Ashaway, who made the uh, first nylon fishing line we had, made a reel. And Damn Quick was a really good good reel, and still is. Uh, the old line. Uh, you know, before we had nylon, we had, uh, we called it Cuddy Hunk. And it was a linen line. And you had to, every time you used it, you had to take it off your reel. You had to put it on a line dryer or whatever and uh, wash it and then dry it and then put it back on your reel and the way they would give you pound test it didn't say uh, 27 pound test it would say nine thread and each one of the threads in that linen line was three pound test so if you had a nine thread rod you had 27 pound test linen and so forth so I've got I've got some 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 of that stuff and uh, Kind of, kind of cool. Got to have the old line in a display. It's really okay. Ta old tackle boxes. Uh, I've uh, just got got one that was uh, donated, and I've just uh, outfitted it. I need to bring it over Cliff. But uh, I tell you, when I open an old tackle box, there's two things that hit me. And remember, this tackle box probably hadn't been opened in 60 years or longer. Two things immediately come into my old factories. One of them is monkey blood, remember, mercurochrome, and the other is real oil. And those two, when you open the lid on that, it just, the hair on the neck stands up <laughs> every time. Just some of the old, you know, stuff. So we're going to have, have a lot of this. I, I'll, I'll do add to these you know some of them are kind of sparse and containers and, but just cool stuff you know there's a line dryer if you took a linen line off there you wound it up on that 
Uh, the old shrimp boxes, everybody remembers those, I guess. Keep you alive, shrimp. Originally made from apple boxes, uh, what they do. But this, this cast net I bought here in 1972 from Fatso Matthews, who did nothing but make cast nets and pluck ducks in the winter. That's what he did. <laughs> And he, Fatso, he was not fat, he was just a rail. I don't know, I guess they called him Fatso because he wasn't. But he said, you're going to cast that mullet off the pier, you need a eight pound net with three quarter inch stretch mesh. Because you've got to get a heavy net to sink down in that deeper water. Off the pier. So that's a, that's a six foot drop, which would be a 12 foot uh, total. And uh, we're going to have that in there with a Bill Moore's bucket that Jay Gardner uh, brought me for the display. And it's going to be mullet bucket and fatso's uh, cast net. He had just started it about that time making monofilament cast nets. And he, he would sew those nets. He'd sit there barefooted. I don't know if he ever wore shoes or not. But he'd stretch that mesh out between his toes and sew it and just go and... There was no equipment involved other than his hands and his toes. Then novelty stuff. Okay, I've got a lot of stuff. As I said, fishermen always coming up with stuff. This was actually a rig that was produced in the Great Lakes back in the 50s or 60s called an autocast. It's got a huge, it's almost like a pogo spring in it. You crank, you cock this back, it's like, First gut, second gut, third gut, type, and let it go. It does not work with that kind of reel. You've never, you've ne you've never seen a backlash quite like it. it. Goes, it goes from zero to about four zillion miles an hour. It worked with a push button, you know, Zebco 808 or something like that. But a novelty, you load your bait and your weight up here and let it go. They were in business about three years. There's a Texas trout fly. That's a 16 odd hook there. Uh, and then a Tony has set a, a go, it's actually said plated, a gold plated spoon. I don't know what that means, but it's about that long. Big, everything's bigger in Texas. If, if Doug English knew that you were a good fisherman, he would call you a field tester and maybe give you a field tester khaki shirt and a helmet that had bingo on it. And that's the way you, the wade fisherman, would uh, go out in the bay with all these different lures on it. And I guarantee if you saw, if I saw anybody like that back in the day, it was like, those guys knew what they were doing. And I've, I've got one of the hats. This hat came from a collection, uh, I call it a, Bing Crosby type hat, you know, just based on the herringbone or whatever you call it. It was a, a Native American Indian guide up in Alaska. And uh, I got, got a bunch of stuff out of, out of that, but little toothy baits. and I can't get the hooks. I don't know how he got the hooks out there all stuck in that herringbone. Dealers, dealer rings, go into a bait shop, you take in your colors, you know, you plug in shardy shrimp or your floater sinkers over here or whatever and uh, say how many you want of each color. Those are, those are real popular, some of the old stringers. Everybody remembers that one, you know. That was kind of like, kind of like, I call that, that's, the gift that I hope my aunt would not give me for Christmas because, <laughs> because she knew I liked to fish, you know, it was like, don't give me that. But uh, I don't know, these, these I, I think ice fishing or something like that, but these were actually used by, my uncle uh, was an uh, oil field gauger and he had several spots on the river. He kept that under the seat of his, uh, his company truck. That was the uh, state record trout at one time caught by uh, Smiley uh, Chatter Allen, uh, but they gutted and gilled it and ate it. But uh, <laughs> I'm in a in a fishing club that uh, 
started out in 1945 by some of these old guys that were doing these companies and everything. And uh, when I got in, the only way you could get in was somebody die. And finally, somebody died. <laughs> and at uh, 97 years old, Dick McCracken died, and I got in. And we still have a membership of about 33 deals. And it all goes by the old rules back in the way it was back in the 40s. It's really cool. But that was uh, kind of a real brief uh, look at what's to come over here. Uh, I uh, told Ashley, I said, Ashley, I, I don't know if you got enough room for what I've got. She said, oh, believe me, you're, it's going to all fit in. But I have uh, accumulated a lot of stuff. And uh, I'm just so happy that I'm able to, to share it and uh, put it out where I want this to be kind of a destination for people are going to go see what Texas coastal people, how fishing started and what they used back in the day. I mean, Cabela's makes attempts at that, Bass Pro Shop, yeah, but not coastal fishing tackle. We're going to have, uh, I've done about 150 rods. Uh, I've got, uh, you know, tackle boxes, hats, all kinds of stuff, photographs. And uh, I just can't wait till we uh, can start moving into it. But Cliff has done a great job over here, giving us, uh, giving me a little room to kind of show you what what's to come. And uh, anyway, I'll be glad to answer any questions that you have or whatever. Before we get to questions, just a quick uh, thing. I, that's Ashley that, that David McKee has mentioned several times in the back. She's the driving force um, behind PAFA and also supplied all your refreshments tonight and, and set up, got up you know, this afternoon, did that for you all. <clears throat> Ash, Ashley Harris. And what? Oh, and also, well, Patty too, also. Uh, Patty, did you stand up earlier? Okay. Yeah. You saw how much stuff we're talking about, and we then sent this archiving angel, this archiving it all for us to the museum. That's right. Yeah. Patty, will you stand up for a second? She's uh, taking yeah. on the big job of cataloging, identifying, detail, giving all the details of all this this huge collection. And also, before you guys got your questions, this is a rare opportunity for me to tell uh, a joke that kind of went up 43 years ago. I came here. And also, uh, before I forget, Mark Creighton is the one that designed all those tackle racks. And, uh, were, and if you have noticed the little fish that hold them on the wall, that's all part of the creative and talent from Mark Creighton right there, too. But 43 years ago, I was. Uh, selling bait and tackle. I was going to school at the Marine Institute and se selling it at a store that's in front of where Virginia's is now. It was called Rick and Virginia Corn's Charter Service and a bait and tackle store. And uh, we had a lot of fun, you know, in the summer there you know, when we were working. And uh, one time a guy came in, and this is in the late 80s, no, late, late 70s, sorry, 79. And he came in and he said, do you have any red humps? And, of course, we've been cutting up all afternoon. And I, I said, well, I did, but they cleared up about a week ago. <laughs> <laughs> and he got as red as that, that lure and walked out the door and I had to chase after him in the, in the parking lot and say, please come back. But you can't fault me for taking advantage of that line. <laughs> well, you gave an honest answer. That's right. <laughs> so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. McKee again. Yes, sir. Uh, I'd lie to you if I tried to come up with a number. I think, what have we got now that I brought over pieces? Over a hundred, but all of them aren't mine. Yeah, but, but there's, oh, and also, uh, Patty's husband, Jerry, is real active at the, uh, at the boat works there, too, so they're really a, big deal but I 
I, I couldn't be happier working with the team of Ashley and Patty and, and Cliff. They're just super. Uh, yes. Excuse me. Uh, use cedar, a lot of cedar. It, uh, I, that's the only blanks that I've seen. I've got some of those that they used, but cedar was the primary one. It was a little bit harder than the white wood, the pine, and uh, uh, but uh, there were there were people that were carving them out of oak and mesquite and things <laughs> like that. But that was more of a just a novelty one time. But commercially produced stuff was it. I've got one thing, no no uh, association at all, connection with lures, but I want to share some advice with y'all. You know, lately I have, and it's a joke, it's a joke, don't take me serious on this. Uh, I've been so fraught about the inflation and immigration, all this stuff's just been eating me up. But I feel so much better now that I've given up all hope. <laughs> It's the only way you're going to get over. Just okay. More questions. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for having me over here, and again, thanks the gang for letting me come over. Thank you very much. I, I, I did bring a few shrimp and some wooden baits over here that I haven't got room for over here that I thought I'd just share with you a little bit and. Uh, they asked me, to, I've got three books. They asked me to bring some books over here. I'm not pushing books. I don't have any for sale, but uh, you can get them on Amazon or uh, Barnes & Noble. or what. They're all on fish. So thank you. I'd be glad to uh, individually answer questions or just talk to you. I know everybody's got that old tackle box. <laughs>